Hello and welcome along to the Rugby Pod with Big Jim and Goody back for season five. And it's we're back. Be- we're back. Yes, we are. You are. It's going to be bigger and better than ever, isn't it? Oh yeah. How yeah. yeah. How yeah. I mean oh. yeah. Well, before we get into how your summer's been so far, we've got a new sponsor on board who's getting the party started with some free beer. They're Woo! Called beer, beer Fifty Two. And it's the most popular craft beer discovery club in the world. They send a brand new case of beers to their members each month from places like New Zealand, South Africa, South Korea, and all over the USA and Europe. And they're a British company as well. So Beer 52 are passionate about UK craft beers as well. So, um, And as a welcome offer for all Rugby Pod listeners, they're offering eight craft beers sourced and curated from the best brewers on the planet for free. All free. you need to do... For free? No way. For free. Absolutely. Absolutely. No charge for the beers. All you need to do is go to beer52.com forward slash rugby. Make sure you put in that forward slash rugby. You'll get eight free beers and only have to cover for the postage. That's the word beer followed by the number 52.com. And you can choose from dark beer or light beers and your case will come with an award-winning beer magazine called Ferment and a tasty snack in there as well. And if you change your mind, um, you can pause your subscription. You can cancel your account at any time. Uh, just go to beer52.com forward slash rugby. Don't forget that bit to get your first case of eight beers for free. That's beer52.com forward slash rugby. And by doing so, you'll also be supporting the rugby pod. And if your brand or company wants to reach the millions of rugby pod listeners throughout the season, I just get in touch by emailing dot com for all details on how we can help. How's your last couple of months been, lads? Firstly, how good is it to be back? Season five. It's been four long years with you, Jim, and now we're into season five. It's been unbelievable. But to start off the new pod, we're offering all our listeners free beers. Get the bloody beers in, Beer 52. You're welcome, people. Mate, they're not just a UK company. They're a Scottish company. Hey, you doing? Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Are you still, exactly. Scotland still in the UK? They are, mate. Oh, yeah. They are, mate. I yeah, think yeah. so. I think so. You might be asking the wrong person. But, mate, Goody, yeah, <laughs> it is good to be back. Um, I like your hair and all that. You're looking great. Thank I've you. Lied, but I've lied, but I'm, you know, it's just all positive. <laughs> it's all about positive energy. And as you said, a big shout out to Beer 52. A big thank you. I've used Beer 52 before. Sometimes you can promote stuff for the sake of promoting. We don't do that. We don't do it. We're not doing it now. I use Beer 52. You can have Beer 52 for free. So a big shout out to them. And uh, mate, how good is it to be back? I, I tell you what, I'd go as far as saying I've missed you. All of yes. you. Yes. Really? All of you. Yeah, I don't, I don't know whether that's because I've missed you or that in lockdown, if we can still say that word and we're not going to get thrown off the interweb, um, I'd say I've survived, not thrived, <laughs> right? There's two types of people. But there's maybe three. Survival mode, that's me. That's the Hamilton household. We have been in complete survival, try and get through. We thrived for about two or three days. We got the colouring books out. We've done the jigsaws. We've eaten organically. We've done all that. Then next thing, it's like, just try not to shout, Dad. Just try not to shout. <laughs> then you have the other side of people that obviously thrive, put it all on social media, do all them things I've just said. They carry on with the colouring books and jigsaws for months on end. I mean, how long has it been? It's been about a year, it's felt like. And then you get the other ones who literally, it's just every man, woman, child, and dog for themselves. Just, just, it's not even survival. It is literally just, you're on the brink of separation. Maybe that's me. Maybe that's me. You and the missus are still solid. We're solid, but we're not solid as a rock. We're just, oh, uh, baby. we're solid, mate. That's it. But um, yeah. going back to my point, I've missed you. I've missed, I've yeah. missed you all. It might not last. We'll see. I was excited. <laughs> I, was, I was ready to do the podcast from yesterday. Uh, I'm pumped. I'm pumped to be back. Yeah, it's You're great right. to be back. It's great to be back. And you look at it, right? So, you know, you compare your own home life. And I can't wait till we delve into the depths of the last couple of months being Jim Hamilton in his house. Because we've been speaking fairly regularly, haven't we, Jim? Probably two or three times a day, to be honest, because it helps get through the day. Um, and, you know, I've been hearing the stories about what you've been up to in your families and, um, you know, we'll, we'll break into that 
over the next hour or so, or even longer, however long it takes to get it all out of you, Jim. But my missus is, she kind of knows when I have and haven't spoken to Jim, because if I'm starting to get a bit wired at home, if I'm, you know, starting to say things like, she says, you sound like you're off the in-betweeners again, you clearly haven't spoken to your boyfriend Jim today, get on the call, get rid of all your immaturity, speak to Jim, and then come back to me. So it's lockdown, right? And this has helped, you know, this is a kind of therapy, isn't it? Doing the podcast, because you can just say what you want, you can get everything out there where you get your immaturity and then you go to the missus and just act normal and she's happy again. So the podcast helps sanity in my household. That's all I'm saying. And uh, I've missed it. I've missed you all. Jim and I did have a, a bit of a meetup in London one evening, didn't we, Jim? Socially distanced and doing all the right things. But um, yeah, it's been weird not doing the podcast, but we're refreshed. We're ready to go. There's some big news. There's rugby's coming back. Beer 52 are handing out free beers everywhere. And Jim, you look a very nice father sat there in your baggy white t-shirt with your shirt. Where have your shoulders gone in lockdown? What the fuck have you been doing? Just training, mate. Just keeping fit. But you know what it is about the podcast? I can be who I want to be. Um, I can be Jim. I can be the legend. I can be the hero. That All these things that are being screened from the outside coming in. I can be that person. In the house, it's time out, Jim. I'm putting the kids on time out. I'm trying to explain why they need to sit on time out. Next thing, now the twins are more capable in terms of speaking. Um, they're still in nappies. I mean, we're trying to get them out of them. But imagine How was that, to, mate? How was that? They're trying to do, imagine trying to potty train, nappy train, toilet train, twins. When you've got two other kids, when you're working all the time, when you're training like an absolute Trojan and all these things, it's just impossible. Anyway, anyway. I can training be like a Trojan. Yeah, train like a Trojan, mate. Yeah, that's it. Why are you okay. laughing? Andy Rowe, how are you anyway, mate? I'm good, I'm good. Yeah, that's right. Just... Okay, good to hear. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, keep telling us about your potty training, mate. How's that going? No, well, it's oh. not going. That's the thing. So I'm walking oh, in the house from whatever I'm doing, and Freya's putting one of her dollies on time out shouting at them. I'm like, why are you shouting at them? Well, that's what Daddy does. So anyway, there's no <laughs> shouting. <laughs> Apparently, it's all reasoning with kids. You have to reason with them now. When I was younger, I used to get absolutely belted. Um, and then the generation before that, the teachers used to belt you. Now, it's all about trying to reason with a two-year-old. You need to sit there, please. You need to sit on time out because you did not listen to Dad. You will sit here for two minutes. If you move, I'll come. Next thing, you're reading them the rights. Even though you can't go through with the rights, you're reading them. You say, keep, by the end of it, genuinely, I put them on time out and then I walk out. I come back and I've been on a work call to Goody, obviously um, a, uh, a podcast meeting or whatever, and then I head back into the mix. And obviously they're not sat on time out; they're probably sat there for about ten seconds. Um, but I'm trying my very best, <laughs> you know, without breaking down. I'm trying my best. I'm surviving, and that's what life is about. It's about survival. Goody, is it a similar situation in your house because you've got twins at the moment as well? Well, at the moment, you've got I say twins. at the moment, I've got twins. Uh, <laughs> I say no, at the no. moment for Jim because they may not be, yeah. Well, well Jim's, is, Jim's is a seven-day-a-week issue, um, you know, with the twins, with the other kids and all this stuff. It's a seven-day-a-week battle for him. Uh, for me, it's only a three-day-a-week battle because uh, obviously the nanny comes. She is an absolute hero. She comes in, gets them out of bed at about 9.30 in the morning. The twins sleep ridiculously well. And she just takes them out for the day. She is an absolute godsend. So uh, Monday to Thursday, that allows me to um, go on my bike rides. So I've been, yeah, I know, you can see it. Lost a bit of timber. You were going to say it, weren't you, Jim? I mate, genuinely, I think you've lost a bit of timber, I'll be honest. I mean, yeah. on the photo that we put out of the release of the podcast, that's you at your worst. You've read, <laughs> there's a rash. No rash. Stress. There's just, no rash. Just sweaty, no. sweaty, sweaty. Mate, you actually look really, really good. For me. For you. Well, oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 for you. Yeah. So I've been out on the bike, you know, Monday to Thursday, I get out on the bike, uh, you know, obviously working in my foreign exchange job. Um, it's Monday to Thursdays, I'm a different bloke to Friday, Saturday, Sunday, because Friday, Saturday, Sunday is sort of batting down the hatches. The chef's gone, the nanny's not there, you know, the cleaner's not there. So I'm doing the lot with the missus, um, which basically means she does most of it. And I just give advice, which I get in trouble for. So, um, yeah, I mean, listen, it's... It's been interesting. What, what I have found is settling in your own house and staying at home, um, as in, you know, basing myself in the house that we live in, um, is quite a simple way of keeping the twins in a pattern that they enjoy, Jim. Um, 
<laughs> and I know where I'm going with this. Uh, you know, we take them out, we take them to the zoo, we take them to the parks, you know, water parks and stuff that we can go to that have opened up again. So there's loads of activities going on. But the bottom line is, they know they're coming home to their bedroom, coming home to bed. And I'm just looking forward to this one story of Jim Hamilton's lockdown road trip, shall we call it, Jim, with you and the fam. Well, mate, what's six months without moving again? <laughs> where are you now? Because when we've finished the podcast, I don't even know where you are. You, it's a concrete, <laughs> sorry, it's a brick wall like that we just see. That could be anywhere. Mate, there's no wall at the border, mate. There's no wall there. <laughs> there isn't. Not Agents what I saw anyway. Exactly. No, mate, I'm, I'm back where the heart is, where I need to be, where I was born to be, you know? I'm back in Scotland, mate, and the, the, the millions know it, the millions know it, and, you know, like Billy Vanapol used to call me the Beyonce of, of Scotland, and it's, it is what it is, as that famous poet used to say. It's, I'm back, um, I'm back in Scotland, it's a good thing, the kids are happy, and do you know why I'm back in Scotland? Because the kids start school a month early, so they're back in school tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> and that is the only reason I am back in Scotland, I'll be honest, but it's good, it's good to be home again. We'll see where we are in six months' time, but um, I don't, I genuinely, during lockdown, and um, we know we were thinning um, over the last couple of years for whatever reason, sun's got on board, boom, we're, we're getting back to my very best, grey hairs, grey hairs in the last two months have started sprouting out. Thank right. God I look good with it, mate. I look like Mick Jagger. Um, <laughs> you got great ass. And how did, the, how did the family enjoy the trip back to Scotland? Are they happy? Because I know you wanted to be back there. I know it's where you want to be, but how's the family? I didn't ask them. I put them on time out as soon as we got here. So. <laughs> <laughs> that, wasn't the first thing, that wasn't the first thing that, that I asked them, nor have I asked them over the last three or four months because it's survival. You don't look back. We didn't look back for the journey. Everything is about the here and now and just waking up the next day, praying for no screaming, praying <laughs> for no shouting, and praying that it's my morning where there's no shit in the nappy. That is what. That is it. That is all I think. I'm living in the moment. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's been tough for everyone, hasn't it? Uh, my golf handicap's come down though as well, which is pretty good. You know, time. So I love the nanny. My golf handicap's down. I've been out on the bike. Lost a little bit of timber, not much. Um, it's always interesting. You, you boys are cyclists as well. Why is it that wherever you go, you feel like you're going uphill into the wind? Is it just mm. the mess that is on the mass or the mess that is on the bike? Or, you know, Magooch has got used to sitting on think, that tiny little saddle now as well. I think when you're just going that fast, Goody, um, that, that headwind's always going to be there. Yeah. Or, it or it's the it. case, and I'm not, I'm not that scientific, um, nor am I into physics and stuff like that, but aerodynamic and all that. Mate, when you're three yeah. people wide, when you're three people wide and you're hanging over the bike. <laughs> you know, it's like a cardboard box that's been flattened, mate, on a bike. Yeah. <laughs> like, it ain't going. It ain't going. So, you ask, mate, you, but genuinely, now you're looking more, I'm trying to think of a shape that you look like. You're looking more, not like a pear, you're looking more like a melon, I'd say. So. Yes, yes. Yeah, so. Well, hold on, a melon's round, a melon's round on the... Yeah, isn't it? Yeah, so it's that's probably worse. worse. That, that's bigger, Jim. That's bigger. Oh, is that okay? oval than round? Aubergine. You're looking like uh, Stash, an aubergine. Yeah, that'll do. That'll yeah, do. Thanks, James. You're Thanks, welcome. James. It's a vegetable, mate, so it's healthy. Yeah, yeah, yeah I eat those. Well, it's uh, just two more sleeps until the Premiership's back, uh, and we've got a lot of catching up to do. So let's quickly get your take on uh, some of the biggest stories that, of recent weeks. There's been rumours out there um, that another club in the running for the top four as well are uh, being investigated for a salary cap breach, isn't there, Goody? Well, rumours, um, yeah, I, I don't know too much about it, to be honest. Who? It's, who? It, well, it can't be Saracens. I mean, that, that's, that's a good thing for everyone, that it isn't Saracens. But no, I mean, like they have said, they've agreed to uh, the new formatting for the salary cap and, and what it entails. Uh, we went through all this before on in season four of, of the podcast, but there's obviously very rigorous checks now um, that all the clubs are signed up to. So you'd expect every club to be going through a regular audit. I don't know anything really around which club it is that's potentially breached it. Um, you know, you can look at a few that always pop into people's imagination when you're talking about it by just looking at the squads. But you know, I don't think that's the big news out of the last few weeks. You know, you hope that those audits are, are ongoing and clubs are 
living and dying by what they've all signed up to and agreed to now uh, with a load of transparency. Um, I think the bigger thing is is what squads have done pre-lockdown, during lockdown and now post-lockdown in terms of we've seen a lot of change at a lot of clubs, um, good and bad, and, and, and that's the big story really. And, and the salary cap stuff will come out if there is something to investigate over the next few weeks. Just on that, um, Glenn Smith wants to know, he tweeted in, uh, wants to know who's had the best lockdown, Goody. Do you, um, who do you think is going to benefit the most from the squad changes and, and um, the break during the time since the Premiership season was paused? Um, yeah, the headline one, two clubs really, the two, the two headline clubs are probably, for me, Bristol, without a shadow of a doubt, uh, anyone or any team that's got Sammy Randrander in it, um, it's going to be way better than they were without him. So he, he's a world, world star. Um, so all eyes are going to be on Bristol. Uh, obviously, Carl Sinclair's gone there as well. There's been other players um, that have moved there that are going to have a massive impact. And then obviously Sale as well. Sale were in a great spot pre-lockdown. Um, they're actually one of the first clubs to get everyone signed up. We spoke about it at the back end of last season, uh, as in season four of, of the podcast, that they got everyone signed up to um, extended contracts with reduced um, salary to, to keep the club afloat. And we'll, we'll come on to that in a bit. But obviously the big news that Manu's gone there, um, you know, and if he can be as devastating for Sale as he is for England at times, they're going to be, you know, a massive team over the, the coming 18 months, but there's plenty to talk about about that deal as well. So I'd say best lockdown from pre where your squad was to where it is now has got to be Bristol. Yeah, I agree with Goody as well. Um, And they've got an unbelievable training facility and Pat Lamb's an absolute legend. He's been on the podcast as well. But look, if we do go back slightly, and again, I've not really thought too much about rugby. We've watched the Aotearoa uh, Championship in New Zealand, which how good was that, by the way? Of course it was. Um, But Rugby was in a right mess, wasn't it? Now, we're obviously all happy that the season's back up and running uh, this weekend, which is class. It seems that a few things have kind of been sorted out around players' salaries. I don't know whether it's all completely done. I'm aware that it's not. There's still stuff going on behind the scenes. Again, all rumours, so we don't want to talk too much about that until it's probably confirmed. But rugby in England, as it were, is in a little bit of a state still. Like We can't hide away from that's the facts of it, right? And that's no one's fault. It's all to do with the situation we found ourselves in in recent months. But we do want to draw out the positives. And I think Goody's mentioned mentioned it there. Sale look amazing. I can't wait to see what they're going to do. Bristol mentioned the training facility. Uh, Leicester with Borthwick now. They've made a load of changes in the background. But their squad came out. I saw the release of their squad. You know, these clubs are finalising their squads. I can't see what Leicester are going to do. But anyway, Bortha seems like he's making a huge difference from what I'm hearing in terms of how elitist he is as a coach. Anyway, some inside info. And then Gloucester's, obviously the other one, loads of changes. And obviously that was headline news just before we ended season four. A few different revelations, rumours were coming out. But man, you know, they've made some big changes. They've made some good changes. For the better as well but I don't know I wonder what it's going to be like because obviously watching it on TV now I'm not commentating on any of the Gallagher Premiership games I'm commentating on hashtag always Edinburgh versus Glasgow in a couple of weeks time in the Guinness Pro 14 but it's the whole rugby with no crowds is going to obviously be a really weird one now in New Zealand they've obviously got fans so you're watching it you've got the atmosphere it's just going to be really interesting how that kind of unfolds and whether you can kind of pick that up, whether they've got a crowd noise during the game and all that kind of stuff. But look, I think we're all happy that we're at a stage now that the, the season up and running. We had Darren Childs on, uh, we had Hoppers on uh, in season four talking about what ifs and what's going to happen. Well, we know we're starting back up and uh, Bristol's and Sale, along with Exeter, Northampton, they look in decent shape from what I've seen. Oh, and Sean O'Brien's arms look very big for London Irish as well. Tuesday, do don't know. He hasn't ever skipped arm day, has he? Um, but yeah, I mean, looking at it, the, the, the big positive, I suppose, for everyone, and we talked about this at the back end of the season, is we've now got to a point where rugby's starting again. And as it currently stands, there were rumours and there were worries that a club, a premiership professional club, could go bust. So we've got this far, and Tony Rowe talked about it. They're losing a million quid a month, I think it is, uh, extra Chiefs. Um, and, you know, at the minute, those clubs are still just about some of them holding on by the skin of their teeth and they had to make drastic changes. Look at Leicester. 
for example, um, you know, the way they handled everything and they had to because they're a, a PLC that, you know, has to report to shareholders and they have to make changes and, and cut, cut costs. Um, so the good news is we're back. The Premiership's kicking off this weekend and we've still got all 12 of those clubs in business where there was a huge worry that one of them could go out of business. Now, ultimately, you go into what Tony Rose said and if that carries on post, you know, January 2021, the clubs could go to the wall. So it's an ongoing thing. Of course it is. Um, we're delighted to see rugby coming back on the, on our TVs this weekend. We're delighted that all the clubs have managed to navigate their way through the whole COVID issue uh, and coming out of lockdown, getting back into training, getting ready to play uh, top class games again, even though the stadiums are you know, not going to have any, any fans in. Um, but they've all played these kind of trial games at club level as well, haven't they, uh, over the last sort of week or so. So it looks like they're in a good position. Next stage, obviously, as Tony Rowe said, is to get bombs on seats so that clubs can continue to um, you know, stay alive and not go to, to the wall. Jim, you touched on Gloucester just moments ago. What did you make of George Skevington's appointment there? I was surprised, uh, to be honest with you. And that's no um, disrespect to George. For everything that I heard about George and people that you speak to in the game, a fantastic young coach. But the kind of more the weeks have gone on, I can kind of see why Gloucester have gone down that route. You know, you've got a young English coach, coaches the forwards. And there was loads of big changes, obviously, going on behind the scenes. I imagine Alex King was probably spoken about. He was in the wings, potentially, to come in. And that, they kind of knew that because of the experience that he brings in. Um, but, yeah, I was a little bit surprised. But now that I'm thinking about it and watching how the premiership and how rugby's unfolding, it's a smart move by Gloucester. Because if they don't do well... They're in the building phase, aren't they? And George can be learning kind of in that role. And when finances open back up, potentially down the line, they can potentially bring in a director of rugby ahead of him. And he can carry on as a young English coach, coaching the forwards with Alex King, Trevor Woodman as well, um, Timmy Taylor, who's involved. The big surprise that they didn't keep Rory T because that's ultimately, let's not beat around the bush and talk about something that was uncomfortable before everyone thought he was in line to get the head coach role. So that's a massive call for them to get rid of him, especially after everything that we heard, the stuff that we spoke about, the, the headline stuff as well. Gloucester have made some big, big decisions and they've gone and there's been a complete wipeout of the top. And seemingly what we're obviously speaking about here is George Skivington wants his own people. I think he worked with Alex King at Wasps potentially. Um, and you need that. You need you need that going into a team. You need that kind of trust element, as it were. And they're building. You know, it'll be interesting to see how Cipriani plays this season for them. They've got some fantastic players. Um, but I, I don't know. I just don't know where Gloucester are going to go. I think a mid-table team at best. You know, what's their ambition? Top six as most clubs. But anyway, in answer to your question, I think George Gibbons will be great. It's great for English rugby from that point of view that you've got another English coach at the helm of a, a big traditional English team. I think picking up on that, you look at a few things. So obviously, you know, we said them on and predicted them a little bit on the podcast, how we had a bit of inside knowledge. Obviously, Johan Ackerman uh, departs and, you know, a bit of that was what we spoke about with players potentially undermining him um, and going to the CEO, which, you know, we spoke about all these things on uh, at back end of season four and, and lo and behold they all came to fruition then I said that that wouldn't be the last change that happens there a couple of weeks later David Humphreys who was supposed to be leading the charge to get a new coach he leaves because his job became untenable as well and ultimately with that the flow of events um, happen and I know that obviously David Humphreys was very well paid he's got a very good payout and rightly so because he was in contract and that's one of the decisions they've made and you know in getting George Skivington you look at the coaching squad now and you can probably say there isn't a massive amount of experience, top-level experience, except for Alex King. Um, so these guys wouldn't have been expensive, and that is a, a brutal fact of, of where we're at with COVID. So they know they've had to pay off David Humphreys. Um, they've gone and looked within young English talent that could have huge potential as coaches, George Skivington on the list. There's also a legal battle now going on with London Irish around um, the release of George because he was under contract. I wish George Skivington the best. He's a quality bloke. Um, you know, he's a really good guy. And, and from, from the people that you speak to, he's like a, a lesser experienced kind of Steve Borthwick when it comes to detail, when it comes to 
how he wants to play the game and that understanding, especially of forward play, which is imperative in the Premiership. And, you know, line-out noises generally make decent coaches, Borthwick being a great example. So, you know, you then factor in Alex King. I know King really well. I, from what I've heard, he's a really good coach. He's got a great sort of attitude to attack. Um, the one that came out of the blue completely was Don Waldock. Um, who, you know, Dom's a great guy as well. He was coaching, sort of player coach of the backs defence at Newcastle. So a kind of role that's under a defensive coach. He's just coaching the back set piece defence, I think it was. So he hasn't got a massive amount of experience, but hey, guess what? He's best mates with Danny Cipriani, who we know pulls a few strings at that club because he gets on well with Lance Bradley and Lance Bradley listens to him. Uh, the one big thing that Jim mentioned there about Rory Teague uh, of, of him departing the club, that actually came out off the back of uh, Martin St. Quentin, the owner and the board, looking into actually what's happened here. What has happened? Why has it happened? And it all came true that actually uh, Rory Teague was trying to push himself into the role and, and uh, wanted to be head coach and, and did it in a way that was a bit cloak and dagger. Um, so then I think George Gibson said, actually, I don't want that sort of person in my team, whether these are actual things that George said or the feelings that people are getting. And they had to get rid of Rory Teague. So um, I think, you know, in a, in a power position, Rory Teague wanted to position himself to be head coach. That was the way it was looking. Uh, the board and Martin St. Quentin looked into it and actually said, we can't have that because of the way things have happened underhandedly up to this point. And now you're left with a, a decent young English coaching team. There's a bit of Wasps background there with, um, you know, those guys coming from a very successful era of Wasps back in the day. So understanding what it takes to win. But also with that, there's a massive amount of inexperience because none of them have been head coaches. None of them have been that lead guy. But that's why it's exciting as well as um, looking at it and going question marks. Um, and, you know, Jim says mid-table, they've lost a lot of quality within the squad as well. I know Murray signed till the end of the Premiership season, uh, but you know you've lost Moster. Um, there's a few other guys that have left. Oh, as well. Marshall, yeah, Marshall's gone as well. So, he was but they have, as well. But they have got bah, 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 the funky chicken gone back in there. Yeah. Uh, Johnny May. So th listen, there's exciting times for every club, and you speak to a few people around the game. And I've spoken to a few head coaches. I've spoken to a few people within pretty high up jobs at, at rugby clubs around the Premiership, and they all say the same thing. They all say everyone. Is training well. Everyone's excited. Everyone thinks they're going to be a great team until the first ball is kicked. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of excitement building and buzzing around every club and, and the return to play and expectations that actually this year anyone could put a run of games together and have a charge at the title, obviously, except for Saracens uh, because of what's gone on before. And that's what's so exciting. Every club is looking forward to getting back for that reason. Goody, do you think Sale will be one of those that have... Uh increase their chances of having a, a stringing a, a few game good games together now that Manu Tuolangi's headed over there? Um, well, first and foremost, you know, the fact that Manu's gone there is a massive plus for them. He's a, he's a world-class player and we might get to talk about why he's gone there and how he's gone there, etc. But let's go back, let's rewind to what Sale were doing pre-lockdown. You know, they went and won away down at Exeter in the league. Um, they were on a fantastic run of form. And they were quietly going about their business without shouting from the rooftops about creeping into the top four, you know, looking at trying to finish second or first, potentially putting pressure on to get that home semi-final. And now they made some noises in, in lockdown around getting all their squad signed up really quickly. So it looked like a, a happy squad. Then you add in Manu Tuolangi and all of a sudden you've gone from being a real contender anyway to actu actually making big noises and looking at the facts that there's an expectation now, I suppose. Whereas before it was like, hey, here we come. We've got this plan. We're, we're slowly making progress. Now they're right in the limelight. You've got a world star in Manu there. You've got everything that was great about the club pre-lockdown um, in terms of results, in terms of performances. The Dupree boys are there. You know, Faf de Klerk. Beaumont's coming back from injury now. But there's so many positives there. Um, and they're definitely contenders. And you go back to the point of, Anyone can win it this year now. The big question mark around Exeter is they've been to four finals, I think, Exeter, yet only won one. So, but now everyone expects Exeter to win because Saracens aren't there. And here come Bristol, here come Sale. Manu Tuolangi's in the mix. This is a, a team certainly to be reckoned with. Yeah, I'm a goody. I think Sale uh, are going to be really exciting. Uh, I've always liked the way that Sale play. Always tough to play against. Uh, Northern, Northerners, even though they might not all be Northerners, but uh, Steve Diamond is. I think the pressure's on for Steve Diamond there because... 
clearly they've got an influx of money. Uh, they've got the ambition. I've seen some stuff uh, going on around their stadium and stuff like that. So they've got great ambition, which is great for the northern part of England, considering Leeds have now, or Yorkshire, Carnegie have fallen by the wayside. The big thing is Manu, and he's the headline, obviously going to sound naturally with his name. How weird is it now seeing Leicester without a two lane? And I, I just... I, I know their arm's been forced slightly because of everything that's happened, but everything you heard, it was kind of a sour note, which is a real shame because Leicester and the two Alangis have gone hand in hand for, what is it going to be, 20 years? Yeah. 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 Do, do you know what I mean? So that's a real shame. But from a sale perspective, with the players they've got, uh, Lou Diego as well in the second row, uh, mate, they're going to be quality. They, mate, South Africans, just bang them in there, mate. There you go. <laughs> well, the, the beauty of Manu um, for Sale is they got him cheaply as well. So Sale came into the into the picture very late on for uh, for Manu. Obviously, things developed at Leicester, and you know Manu didn't think that actually Leicester would want to cut him by twenty five percent, and it was a bit of a game of chicken. Leicester stayed strong and and said, "Listen, this is the same for every player at this club." Um, so uh, Ellis Gens resigned. George Ford re-signed. These, these guys all took 25% pay cuts. And what Leicester offered Manu to Alangi on paper and an extension was way more than he's on at sale. So it's an interesting kind of take on it. He, you know, there were reports that he went back to Leicester and said, listen, please, you know, can we, can we sort this out after the deadline? And Leicester said, no, you know, it, we've worked out the value to us that you've given us over, I think he averaged 11 games a year over his career there. And he's a brilliant player, Manu. But ultimately, when you have to look at things as a business, and you have to take a stance, and he didn't agree the, the pay cut that all the other players did that have stayed, then he has to look elsewhere. And, and Sale have got a really good deal, I believe. A, to keep him in the Premiership, because he was desperate to do that, to stay and play for England. B, they've got him on a really cheap deal compared to what he was offered, and it's comfortably, I'm going to say it's around 50% less at Sale than what he would have earned having oh. taken a pay cut at Leicester. So, a big financial decision. Well, we can find out a bit more about how the move came about and how Manu's settling in now because sale owner Simon Orange joins us. How are you, mate? I'm all right, thanks. Tim Goo? Yeah, good to have you on, mate. Uh, looks sunny up in Manchester, which is a bit of a change. Because uh, every time uh, I go there, it's, no, no, it's raining. We've, we've had some great weather during the uh, lockdown. It's been, it's been very pleasant. We started barbecuing and everything. Lovely, so you've had a bit of sunshine. Anyway, um, let's have a chat then. As Sorry, a... I don't sound like that, Goody. <laughs> no, that was, I think that was more Dean Schofield. That's what I'm used to, and, or yeah, Mark Cueto, but there we go. Um, so how's it been for you over lockdown uh, as a club owner over the past few months? I know there's been loads of stuff up around the press about clubs losing money hand over fist. You're the owner of Sale Sharks, and um, you know potentially people look at owners to fill a void of cash. Um, how's it been for you and the challenges that coronavirus have uh, Pose for everyone, I suppose. Yeah, it's been tough, to be honest. Probably no tougher than it is for everyone else. Um, I think a lot of people are in the same boat, aren't they? Uh, our main business has, has found it tough. We've, we've got, we have lots of businesses. Uh, I seem to have been looking at cash flows for the last three months, just making sure everything's all right. Uh, and obviously, rugby is really difficult because we've got, what have you got, eight, nine hundred grand a month going out, or whatever it is, and uh, zero coming in it. Uh, it is tough. We we, um, we invested the CVC money, so we'll we'll, uh, we'll be cashing that in over the next year or two, and and hopefully that'll uh, will cover us. Try and save uh, me and Jed putting our hands in our pockets too much, but uh, yeah, same same boat as everyone else. Really, it's not been easy, but you just got to get on with it, haven't you? Of course, yeah. Uh, so I'm talking about lockdown, and we we have to be worried when we say that word. I don't know if your brother told you, but I saw him in a coffee shop. In Stow and the Wold, in the Cotswolds, I was talking to him. I think he knew me. Did he tell you that I saw him or not? Did he mention it or not? Yeah, no. he, uh, yeah, yeah. He got on the phone straight away to let me know. <laughs> <laughs> on the phone, he was he was well excited. Mate, of course, mate. Well, you know what? He he was wearing these Birkenstock clogs, right, um, at the coffee shop, and I actually thought to myself, they look cool as anything. So look what I went and did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I went Actually, and got myself a pair. With his beard, Jim, you've got a look at him. Have you, have you ever been in a band? Well, funny you say that. Yeah, I was in the Mumford and Sons for a night in Dublin, but that's a story for another day. Um, <laughs> so, but, um, mate, let's talk a little bit about rugby. I, I just said it before we got you on the show, but I love say I loved playing against them. Um, but as a club owner and watching the history of sale, 
I mean, me, I played in the final when, when they won in 2006, scored a try. I don't know if you knew yeah. that as well. Anyway. I know you did. Yeah, you did at the end, didn't you? Of course, yeah. I did at the old pick and go. Um, but look, you know, it's been a tough journey for sale. Rugby in the north as a whole with Yorkshire Carnegie. There's been a bit of investment now. You can see that from afar. You can see with the performances and you can see with the culture that's been built. As a club owner, how excited are you now? Not just as a club owner of rugby, but for the kind of, you know, you're representing the, the north, as it were, of England. Yeah, um, well, don't forget this, this Seymour in Newcastle, but uh, yeah, we're certainly representing the Northwest. Uh, we've got a big pool of talent. We, we always have had. We've always produced uh, lots of lots of great rugby players, and, and in the past, wealthier clubs have have taken them from us, um, and, and players have gone for more money and better opportunity. And, and you can't really blame them for that. So that was one of the first things I wanted to stop w- when we took over. Uh, and, and to a great extent, we have done. So we're, um, we've invested heavily in the academy and, and uh, with a bit of luck, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to keep most of them as we go forward. So, yeah, it is, um, it, it has been, I've been a, a fan of for sale for 25 years or something. Uh, and other than a very brief time when we, when, uh, we had Philip Saint-André and all the, uh, all the French geezers in, it, it's, it's been a tough road. So it's been good to... Uh, make a long-term investment and, and, and help the club. Um, I was going to say help the club you love. I wouldn't even say I loved Sale before. I, I, w- I was just a fan. Um, if we lost on a, on a Friday or a Saturday, it'd ruin that day. Uh, now, of course, being the owner, it ruins your week and it ruins your life. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's, a, bit, it's a bit more of an investment. But uh, yeah, it's, it's certainly enjoyable. I'd say it's the best and the worst thing I've ever done. Yeah, nice. <laughs> Great way to hear about it. Let's talk about the club then, because obviously you were the first club to announce the getting everyone sort of cut on a 25% um, reduction and to have them sign up in, uh, over the longer term with all the changes around the salary cap. How difficult was that? Um, and how much was it Dimes flexed his muscles and saying, you will fucking sign this or you'll be out on your ear? <laughs> no, uh, he, he doesn't deserve his reputation some of the time. <laughs> I mean, some he does, to be fair. But no, it was, we had a lot of difficult conversations um, Steve and I both met with the squad three or four times um, and we went through everything with them. We told them the whole situation. We then had individual meetings with the players uh, and, and we were just explaining the, 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 the business facts of life. Uh, they're a good set of lads. They realised we wanted to keep our squad together, which was, what was, was our requirement going into the discussions. Um, and, and so they've all agreed it. It was it was a bit disappointed to be honest to find out the RPA had been giving advice out saying not to take any pay cuts, um, and particularly Gauling, considering they'd all taken pay cuts as well as the all the RFU and as well as Premier Rugby and almost everybody in the world. Um, but to be fair, our lads figured it out themselves. Um, no one had an arm behind the back at all, and I was in every meeting, so I know. Uh, <laughs> So, so no, they've, they've accepted it, as have the coaches, as have the commercial staff. Um, so it's just when things get tough, if, you've got, if you're with the right people and you're surrounded by the right people, they all, they all wade in, don't they? And rightly so. Um, but you mentioned the RPA there. I know it's uncharted territory. We've obviously never seen this situation ever and hopefully we'll never see it again. But how has that all been managed? I mean, clearly it's has been managed well because... There's no rumours come out. You know, we've not spoken about anything because things have all been done in-house, which is, as a club owner, I'm sure that's exactly how you want to see it. But how has the process been managed? I know other sports have been good, they've been bad. Whatever we see in Australia, it's been obviously a free-for-all. But in terms of the Premiership and, you know, Premiership Rugby, you've mentioned the RPA there, everything that goes around it, how has it been managed as a business owner, I suppose? Well, at, 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 the, at the club level, at Premiership level... Um... We, we did have discussions with the RPA and we were talking about possibly doing something across the board, like a collective agreement. But, but really, it, it's, that's not going to work. So players, players are in different positions. Clubs are in different positions. Contracts are at different stages. So, um, for, for instance, our academy lads um, have, have all had rises because you, you can't cut someone who's earning 10 grand a year or whatever. So, so they've had rises um, and our, our medium and, and uh, bigger players have, have all taken drops, as have the management and, and we've, we've done it in that way. So 
the biggest drop the biggest drop in our club has been Steve Diamond and the and the smallest drops have been the, the lowest earners so as a, as a club we just try to do it fairly and in collaboration so if somebody's if somebody can't afford the mortgage or would have to go and get a part-time job as well as doing what they do then we'll work with them and we'll, we'll figure it out we, 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 we're not we don't want to put anyone on 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 um, going to food banks or anything uh, so so individually I think the clubs have to deal with it I think some probably dealt with it better than others I, mean, I can't really speak for other clubs but but as a whole I, th I think most people have got through it pretty well and it's just it's not great for the players um i, I know goody said a, a couple of podcasts ago we're, we're paying we're losing 50 million quid a year and we're paying 100 million quid in wages we, we've just got a, we, the owner it's not the players fault that they've got to earn what they can earn but the owners and the dors have just got a bit carried away competing with each other and it's not sustainable and uh covid has brought it into stark reality and and hopefully It'll be the impetus we need to fix it. That is one of the things that you said before, obviously, you know, talking about the salary cap and you know, COVID has brought this into stark reality. But even without COVID, those issues were there massively, weren't they? And you yourself said it would it was easy previously to cheat the salary cap. Lord Miners Review has come in and, and the clubs have signed up to it. How important is that for the longevity of the game, especially for a club like yourselves who are planning potentially this new stadium as well in the future? I think it's massive, Andy. Yeah, um, we, 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 the, the the secret to the Premier League, I think, is to make it competitive. And if you've got all the teams spending around about the same money, it, it's going to, going to end up being competitive, isn't it? And, and more exciting. And that's what it's got to be to grow. Um, it was easy to cheat the cap. I think clubs have been doing it for years, on and off at different stages, uh, and, and it really needed sorting out. Um, the Saracen saga gave us the impetus to sort it out. And, and the miners report, I think he came up with 52 or 53 recommendations. I can't remember what they were. And some of them, to be honest, probably over the top. But um, he did say it wasn't a menu. He, he, he did recommend that we take them all on board. And that was the way we'd sort it out. And it needed sorting out. So we've, we've voted it through unanimously. And uh, we will get it sorted out. So it'll be a lot harder to cheat the cap. There'll be a lot more people involved in, in, in having to cheat it. And the penalties are a lot more severe. So with a bit of luck, uh, that's, that's stopped. And we, uh, we can get on with having a, a good and fair league. Absolutely. I think that's what we all want. And we, we've all spoken about it. I know me and Goody were split when we spoke about the sal uh, Saracens and the salary cap thing. Uh, but look, right decision has been made and that's all come out. But now it comes to the point where, and you're going to be feeling it, fingers pointing at Sale, pointing at Bristol, because of the quality of players that you've brought in. Um, let's talk a little bit about that because there's going to be pressure now, isn't there? And obviously Steve was very outspoken around the Saracens salary cap thing, and rightly so. You know, he's been grafting at the helm, as you have a lot of hard money going in, and, you, and, you, and you know, you're pissing uphill, as the famous saying goes. Yeah. Um, so, like, how is it for you now with that pressure? Because, you know, you signed Manu, and we know a little bit around the Manu deal that he probably wasn't quite as expensive as people thought. You've brought in uh, Lou Diego, who's one of the best locks in the world. Are you feeling any pressure that you feel you have to justify every signing and every kind of squad you put together? No, no not at all. Um, we, we've, we, we had a strategy that, that we... we um, well, when I took over, Steve ran a small squad and he was spending... It was 50 60%, I think, of, of, of everybody else or of the average. Uh, so, so we had fewer players... Um, and probably lesser quality, if, if, if that's the right word. Uh, so we, we came up with a strategy that within the cap, if we kept it to only 32 players, because he's always looked after them well, we've had the lowest injury rate, I think, in the league every year for, for as, far as, as, as far as we can remember. So if you can look after them, you don't need 45 players. So we decided we'd have 32 players and let's say we spent eight and a half million. Let's say that was what you could get, what you could spend with injury dispensation and marquee players and everything else and, and the academy. Um, if you spend an eight and a half million on 32 players rather than eight and a half million on 45 players, you're going to get better players, aren't you? And that's what we've got, I think. I think our 32 players can compete against almost any 32 squad in the world. Um, the difference is, 
if we took 20 injuries, like say Bath have done in the past, then we'd, we'd, be, we'd be shooting ourselves in the foot and we've been in a bit of trouble. Um, so I don't know what the sums are. Let, let's say the average wage is 200 grand in the Premiership. Our, our average at sale might be 250, let's say, because we've got better players. But we've only got 32 of them. So um, our books are open to the, to the salary cap manager. Um, we go through it all the time with him. And we've no secret deals or anything like that. So I'm absolutely no pressure on the salary cap. And in fact, I'm delighted everybody thinks we are breaking the cap because we must be doing something right with the squad, if that's the case. One, one thing he did mention in, in his question was a bit about pressure, which there's clearly, from your perspective, no pressure around the salary cap. But what there is now, perhaps, is uh, a bit of pressure around the signing of Manitou Alangi, the fact that Sale were on an unbelievable run of form pre-lockdown. Um, and I think yourself, you said... Uh, the plan was to sign Manu, win the league and fill the stadium. So that's a brilliant quote and I love it. Um, you know, I love a bit of Northern confidence as well, having been, or well, still am good mates with Scurry and, uh, and Mark Cueto. They rate themselves massively highly. So <laughs> tell me about the pressure. Um, uh, well, tell me about Manu. How's, how, how's Manu settled in as well? Yeah, uh, well, Manu settled in really, really well. Uh, apparently he's been magnificent in training. So, so that seems to be going well. Uh, unfortunately, the quote you liked, I don't think I actually said it. I think that was more an editor's Oh, come headline. on, just claim it. <laughs> no, I, well, yeah, more an editor's headline. Uh, luckily enough, the pressure isn't on me. That's on Diamond. It, that's, it's, his job, it's his job to deliver, uh, not mine. Uh, so, yeah, there, there, is, there is pressure. There's more expectation. But we're not, we've, we've got a long-term plan. We're not, we're not trying to win it headlong this season and, and then collapse like we did in 2006. Uh, don't get me wrong, I would like to win it this season and next season and every season, but as long as we're competing in the t regularly in the top four and in Europe uh, most of the time, I think we'll be happy for now. Um, when, when we've done it for as long as Exeter and Saracens, that then, I'll, then I'll probably expect uh, trophies. But, but for now, it's, um, it's a tough league, isn't it? There's so many good teams. I mean... Extras have got to be favourites, and 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 even without us, you you Bristol and Northampton, Wasps, Quinns, Bath. It's just there's just so many teams who can. We 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 could finish, we could finish top this year or ninth, couldn't we? It's, it's that close, which is I think how we want the league. So yeah, there's expectation, um, but I wouldn't have said pressure yet because we're um, it's the first season we've been up to the cap. Uh, we started off slowly, but but we've we got into our groove, and hopefully we can stay in our groove and carry on. But uh, time will tell. Yeah, of course. And you mentioned, uh, well, Gooley mentioned the run of form that you were on before uh, the situation that we found ourselves in now. So leading into the season, there's obviously a lot of games. You mentioned potentially a smaller squad than a lot of teams out there. Yeah. As, as a club owner, you know we've not spoken to anyone since the fixtures have been released. A lot of pressure on the squads, right? Obviously, everyone wants to get out there, but there's going to be a point where the momentum gathers. You're into two games a week, and all everything that comes with that. Yeah. Um, what do you think about all that? Are you glad just the fact the season's going to get finished, and there'll be a bit of TV revenue off the back of that, or is that spoken about in house? Actually, how you manage, you know, play like Manu, who, who naturally doesn't play many games because of the way that he plays. Who could? Um, is that spoken about how you're going to manage the squad during that time? Yeah, it is. Um, and Steve's good at it. Lots of coaches are good at it, and, and the um, it's going to be really important for every club to, to manage the squad. We, we've got 32 senior players, but we've got 10, um, 10 possibly 12 uh, young lads coming through. And, and as you know, at Sale, we've never been afraid to use them. We've never been afraid to stick 18-year-olds in and 19-year-olds. So I think that'll, that they'll all get the chance over the next 12 months. We're looking at this as a 12-month congested period now rather than two different seasons. Um, and we'll just be doing a lot of rotation and, and making sure our lads stay fit. Um, so, so we've got, one of the strengths we've got is I think we've got, effectively, we've got two top class people in every position. Um, and it's almost, we haven't got, a, we've not got a first 15. We've got two first 15s and they're into, they're into, they can intermingle. So yeah, we'll just have to have a lot of rotation. Um, and as I say, the academy lads will, will be getting lots of game time and uh, hopefully we'll, a few stars will come through there as well. We certainly hope so. 
yeah, definitely. It'll be really interesting to see how every squad copes with it. But one, one of the things from off the field then, which is where your major part of the club is, um, in terms of getting fans back in the stadiums, how do you think the government's handled that? And I know Tony Rose came out this week and said they're losing a million quid a month uh, without having fans in stadiums. How imperative is that to try and get it back as quickly as possible to stop you from having to completely put your hand in your pocket and fill that void? Yeah, it's, it's imperative. Tony's right. Um, the, the fact that you can allow people in pubs and restaurants and not let them into an open air stadium just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, and to be fair, a lot of things the government have said are, have not made a lot of sense. I think they're a bit rabbit in headlights at the minute. Um, and they've got some strange decisions coming on. But in terms of rugby, yeah, we need them in as soon as we possibly can, even if it's 20, 30 percent capacity. Um, until the threat of coronas died down a bit, that that would be helpful. But uh, yeah, I think I, I read Tony. I read the report in the Ruby paper what Tony said, and um, he's right. If we don't get fans in, one or two clubs will be in severe trouble and, and could go down. Uh, but again, I suppose that's only the same as business in real life, isn't it? It's it's um, it, it's 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 not been a pleasant experience. It's been a it's been a, a, a once in a lifetime, hopefully problem and uh, everybody's going to get through it as best they can but yeah we could do with a bit of help from the government and getting crowds in as soon as possible would be a massive uh, a massive positive for us. Um, you had an international rugby player in your ranks earlier in the season that departed and went down to Harlequins how much are you looking forward to this weekend's game with Ashley pulling on the Harlequins jersey I can see a smile on your face now the well, South boys, the South boys will be up for that one what did happen go on fill us in I was going to ask you that was going to be my final question just the headline what, what happened to him he's gone home he's left too long big money so we can go come home up north and now he's gone back down south yeah well he's still in England isn't he he's still in England yeah <laughs> uh, Ashi, yeah, I like Ashi a lot. He's um, he's an he's an awkward bastard, yeah. uh, <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that. But but I think there's probably only room for one awkward bastard in a club, and we've we've already <laughs> we've already got ours is the is the DOR. Uh, so if there was um, if there was ever going to be a difference of opinion, there was only ever going to be one winner, and it was just decided it was better for everyone uh, if if uh, Ashi went. So the I, fact I, I, that yeah, playing I, I, in the first game is um, is uh, it'll be uh, it'll be interesting for him, won't it? But uh, I'll tell you what, he won't shirk it, will he? Ashy, he'll be uh, he'll be well up for it. He will, he will be. If only he could tackle, bless him. I don't, I'm in the around. I'm good <laughs> messing him. I just find it weird. I, I find the whole situation weird because I know you guys uh, went over and over and beyond to get him to sail. It seemed like it would fit. The fact that there was a, a conflict of interest in terms of you know the way the game was played, you guys were flying. So um, yeah, no, no, it, yeah, you, no. Listen, we could have battled on, we could, but it was just decided. It was um, just for basically club and squad unity. It was it was the best thing all around, and uh, uh, we, we I wish him luck. Not not on Friday, but for the rest. <laughs> of the all right, Simon. Good thank stuff. you very much for coming on the show, mate. Really appreciate it, and best of luck uh, restarting the season uh, after the COVID debacle. Thanks, lads. Good to talk to you. Yeah, mate, he's a brilliant bloke, brilliant owner, honest as they come, and has got some great plans for sale with a new ground and everything, and just enjoys honesty, boy. Mate, you're exactly. Honesty is the one, and he said, the first thing he said that Jason knew me, rang him straight away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, straight away, yeah, honest. Yeah, Mate, these clogs, mate, I tell you what, if anyone's ever wore Birkenstock clogs, they take a while to break in, my goodness, mate. <laughs> my goodness, we beat her in pieces, but his brother looked good, he looks good, and Sale looking a good place. What I've done now, I've just hit it with three goods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or goods, yeah. or however you want to look at it. But, yeah. mate, hey, spoke really highly of Ashy, didn't he? <laughs> 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 my goodness, my goodness, mate. Yeah. My goodness, mate. What did he say, oh. awkward bastard? Yeah, I'll, he I'll, did I'll, say I'll that. Yeah. Mate, that, that, that's, uh, that's one thing. But I'll tell you what, it's quite interesting because, again, we talk about a salary cap thing or whatever, and as much as he might not be aware of it, we know that people are going to be saying how Sale afforded him, you know, how Bristol afforded him. But, you know, like the momentum's gathering around that because naturally people want to point fingers and it makes headline news. It was actually really interesting. I, I wasn't aware. I've not seen Sale's full squad. But he says they're going in, you know, relatively thin. When we were at Leicester... Back in the day, mate, we had a squad of fifty. Yeah, do you know what I mean? And yeah. all of us were all of us were Lions quality. Do you know what I mean? We were all like <laughs> quality. And mate, you were Monday Night Football. What you on about? Of a <laughs> mate, hey, is that, mate, you had Martin Johnson, Ben K, you had Jim Hamilton, and Tom Ryder. Mate, it, it was much of a mushroom. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> um, but it's interesting that they could be thin on the ground. Hence why I asked around the games and the situation they find themselves in. Yeah. But I'm not just saying it because we've had him on. But I've always loved Sale. I like Northern people. Um, he, you know, they've put a lot of, well, maybe not as much money as other clubs. He mentioned it there. But the investment's been huge from all the owners. And I didn't even mention Newcastle in that. Bless them, they've been relegated. Yorkshire Carnegie have gone. But they are flying the Northern flag for rugby. Obviously, rugby league country. Man United, Man City. True blue. What's the word? Blue moon. Blue yeah. moon. I don't know the rest of the words. You're a Man City fan, now, are you? Well, I could be, mate. Well, no, because they didn't win it, mate. Another four, mate. But I think they're all Reds, though. <laughs> I think I think they're all Reds. Are they? They're all yeah. They're all United fans, mate. I'm a United fan as well. Uh, when yeah, Cancelo was there, but mate, how good is Tommy Mob? Sorry, go on. Yeah, brilliant. Get me off. Go on. Brilliant. And you, you did lose. You did lose a bit of knowledge there with it when he started talking numbers and squad averages and salary averages and all that. You, know you just why? went. My maths hey. teacher was terrible. All I could think about was these clogs cost me 90 quid. And genuinely, <laughs> I swear, I swear on my life, if, I, if I'm lying, lock me down for another six months. His brother had them on and I thought, geez, they look good with socks. So I went out and bought myself a pair, but my feet, they're in pieces, mate. They're like wearing horseshoes. Do, do horses wear shoes? Yeah, they do. Oh, they do, yeah. So I imagine they horses feel in shoes. Yeah, yeah. horseshoe, horse food, yeah. camel toe. We'll get into a couple more questions, a few more talking points soon, uh, but... It's that time we've all been waiting for now, isn't it, Jim? Your feature's back, or, or should I say peel back, isn't it? Yes, Andy Rowe. I'm back, mate. I am back. Now, a lot's happened in the last couple of months. People screaming innuendos. They used to scream melted wheelie bin, which was a little bit derogatory, but it's fine. I got it, because we were lolling and joking on the podcast. Now, people are just screaming, riddle me this, riddle me that. Jim will solve it, and then every all the millions <laughs> of people are shouting... Oh, back. The kids are asking me what peel back means. I'm telling them <laughs> pull back on the banter. That's what it is. <laughs> yeah, I'm back. I'm back. I'm looking forward to it uh, this week. This is my segment. It is your segment, Jim. But I've got a little surprise for you next week as well. Starting from next week, we're going to have a very special guest with a very high IQ to help you through these riddles, talk you through these riddles, give you these riddles. And maybe educate you slightly, so you'll be looking forward to that, won't you, James? Well, I will. I well, will they solve it? I hope yeah. not. Trust me. No. Trust me. She knows all the answers. That's all I'll say. No, I don't, mate. I don't. Oh, it's a she. It's oh, a yes. She with a high oh. IQ. Interesting. But anyway, I don't want her to solve it because it's Jim will solve it. Get it? Riddle me this. Riddle me that. Jim will solve it again, lads. I've already done it, but I'm going to do it again. <laughs> 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 I have keys that open no locks and space but no rooms. You can enter, but you can't go outside. What am I? I have keys that open no locks and space but no rooms. You can enter, but you can't go outside. What am I? Right, so you've got keys. We've all got keys that open no locks. Well, what's the point in having a key? Oh, you've got a room. You can have a card, you know, like one of them hotel cards. And space but no rooms. You can enter, but you can't go outside. What am I? Oh, jeez. Oh, you can hear the... I've missed this. This is what I've missed, actually, the most about the podcast. The pressure that Jim feels now. Reading the riddle, you can just see his brain ticking over mm. exceptionally slowly. I go into, like, a fog. Mm. Yeah. And the heart rate rises... And you start sweating profusely. Mm. You get a trickle down your leg. Maybe a little bit of wee-wee comes out because you're nervous. Tell us about your thought process. What are you looking at at the moment, Jim? Genuinely, I'm in like a, a blank, a blur. All right, I'm just trying to think. Well, it's, quite it ironic that, it's quite ironic that he's probably looking at um, it not closely enough. Or maybe I've, he's I've looking, got keys oh. that open no locks. <laughs> maybe he's looking at it very closely. Got it. What is it? Piano. Oh, no, James, no. I thought, with the confidence then. No, keyboard, keyboard. Oh. Oh. Okay, let's I've, talk us through why you're getting these answers. Tell us what you're thinking. So I've got keys. So a keyboard's got keys. Yeah. Yes. That open no locks. And so yes. It's a piano. It's not about the rest of it. How does, how does the piano fit with the second half of it? Well, because piano's got keys and that open no lock. 
Well, you can't use a piano to open locks. Yeah, correct. And space, but no rooms. But you can, can you enter a piano? Well, you can, because you've got that bit that folds up at the back. So I suppose you could. Uh, mate, who's getting in that? Well, one of the who's twins, mate. One of the twins <laughs> that carry on! Three <laughs> men! Time out. Yeah, get the piano. Uh, you can enter, but you can't go outside. Well, you can have a piano outside. I'm sure you can in Greece or Italy or somewhere like that. It's hot. You can have a piano outside in England. But it's not, is it not a piano? No. It's not a piano, James. You're, You're very right close, train. though. Guitar? No? Is it music related or not? Uh, no. Well, potentially. Well, in, in, a in a roundabout way, it could be, but it's not the technical answer. But the word is involved in music. The word's involved in music? Singing. You, you, Kit, you singing. Can music. Singing. No. Nope. No, you can go outside and sing. Choir. So why did you think it was a piano for a start? Because of keys. Right, okay. Oh, so. What do you mean? Oh. So it's got keys. Think of a piano. What is another form of a piano, James? That thing with it that goes. <laughs> <laughs> What's it called? That's, that's an accordion, but no. Accordion. It's <laughs> yeah. What does an accordion have, though? A piano on it. Also known as a. What are you on about? <laughs> Think of another form of a piano, James. This it is the answer, but it's not the answer. If that makes sense. So you have a piano. You have a grand yeah. piano. If you would you go and buy your kid a piano, or what would you buy them instead? That sounds like a piano and can be used as a piano. Right, I've got it. Because I, yeah, well, I've said a keyboard. Did I say a keyboard? Hey! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a keyboard. It's a keyboard. So, well, so, done. well, it's the same as a. It can be a piano as well, can't well, it? No, it's not a piano keyboard. The word keyboard, but in another use. So. Have a look. What are you, you typing on your phone? What are you using to type on your phone, Jim? Well, it's not. Uh, well, I don't know. I've got this new phone that just that recognises my face. <laughs> How cool is that? Anyway, lads, I've just solved it in my opinion. Riddle me this, riddle me that. Jim just solved it. <laughs> Back. I can't do it. My throat's killing. Don't know. Um, but I'm looking forward to next week. I'm looking forward to next week. So that could be my riddle. Who is it? We have missed rugby. But we're going to have it non-stop for a year now. Do you think player welfare has gone out the window now, lads? Yes. Oh, you do, James? Well, of course it has. They just had six, they just had six months off. Well, that's irrelevant though, isn't it? I'm I mean, joking. You can, have, you, yeah, you, I'm can joking. Have, you can have three years off. You're still coming back in the demands. And again, I've, I've been an advocate. Not that anyone's bothered what I think or I can influence anyone to make any different decisions. There's a finance aspect to it, which is huge. Obviously, Simon mentioned that. Tony Rose mentioned that, everyone will mention that. And there's a part of that which, not just in rugby, in life, we need to get moving, blah, 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 blah. But we've got to do it in a way in which, again, Simon mentioned it, player welfare's got to be at the forefront. I'm telling you now, I could name you a load of players that struggle on a six-day turnaround. Do you know what I mean? And you think of the demands with everything that's obviously goes with the game, the fact that they wouldn't have played for a long time, so how conditioned are you actually going to be to play? Because, like Goody, will t well, maybe he won't tell you because he probably just walked straight into the, the team that, that went out week one in the Premiership. But, you know, it's a restart of the season, effectively, isn't it? You have that, you know, you have a month off, it takes a couple of games to get back into it. You have, as long as they've had off, they've not even been able to train in a, in a team environment until, until recently, you're going to take three or four games to get back to 100%, right? both in terms of taking contact, recovery, everything that goes with that, and you get dead legs, you pick up these kind of small kind of niggly injuries that you can play with. Who's playing on four-day turnarounds? Mate, there, I, I'll tell you now, there ain't going to be many, many that will be able to do that. And, you know, time will tell in terms of the injuries that we could potentially pick up, but what choice do they have? I suppose that's the big question. Goody, you mentioned the Sevens team being disbanded, or Sevens programme being disbanded by the RFU. What are you guys' thoughts on that? Well, it's brutal, isn't it? You know, let's let's not beat around the bush. Whatever has happened during COVID in any business, Simon Aaron said it himself, it's not just rugby, it's across the board in business. Um, you know, there's been cuts, people are losing jobs. You know, the RFU have made loads of redundancies. Um, I know the RPA are currently uh, renewing terms with the RFU in terms of England player payments. 
uh, for matches. You know, we, we joke on here and we, we say it pretty openly. It was 25 grand a game. So yeah, when businesses look at the pandemic and look at what is it going to take to reduce some costs to keep a, a business afloat, where can you cut costs to keep your biggest assets in business? So ultimately, England's biggest uh, or most profitable thing is, is the, the, the international team playing at a full Twickenham without a shadow of a doubt. So they then look at ways in the business, and it's brutal. I know a few of the sevens boys, Charlie Hayter, the women's England women's sevens coach, good mate of mine, Richard De Carpentier, who was you know is a sevens player and a brilliant player, brilliant guy. They're now they haven't got a job, so it's brutal for everyone. Yeah. But what they are a few, and if we're looking at it on the basis of a business sense, they're looking at that saying that is a cost that we can do without at the minute, which doesn't help those guys because they haven't got a job and it's horrific. And I you know I feel for them massively. But that's why the RFU are making those decisions. You know, what's the value in terms of money in the bank to them? What is the cost of it? Is it washing its face with itself? Or is it costing us a load of money? If it is, we have to cut it. And that's the way businesses across the world are being ruthless to try and not go to the wall. Um, and it's horrible. You know, I, you know, I'm desperately sad that the Sevens isn't there. You know, we love going out to Hong Kong and the Sevens over... Uh, uh, the weekend of it, it's brilliant but for these guys it's their jobs it's their livelihood and you expect and want the England sevens team to be a part of it especially a year out from the Olympics when England were going to be representing team GB um, it's a real tough thing for everyone let's have a look at some social media questions Sam Lane oh god let's go on then go Sam on Sam Lane has tweeted in he's asked we well, said Warren Gatlin hasn't done very well with the Chiefs in New Zealand. So is he definitely still the right man to lead the Lions in South Africa? A lot of heat coming Warren Gatlin's way, isn't there? Mate, there is, mate. And Lane only needs to stay in his lane, get it? Because his name's Lane and you told to stay in your lane. Uh, mate, I can, under can understand, can see why people would question it. It's not all glory, is it? But again, having watched the Arte Roa and parts of it, the Chief Chief Chiefs, if you're allowed to say that now, uh, um, Mate, they've got a young, young team, young squad. Gatlin, mate, probably needed it. Bit of grounding. I actually feel for Gatlin. We're friends now. I did a couple of interviews with him. And um, he's warm to me, I think. Um, but yeah, I think... He still didn't pick me there, did he, Jim? He no, still didn't pick you there, did he? Didn't pick me. He didn't pick me. But, you know, if he brings me on the Lions tour as a kit man or friend of the team, friend of the show, rugby pod representative, then it doesn't matter. But, uh, yeah, I think naturally people are going to ask. For me, there's no right man sorry for me he's still the right man for the job there's more talk around who he's going to bring with him Stuart Lancaster's name's been brought into the ring that's been confirmed that Gatton spoke to him you know where does that leave Rob Howley Graham Roundtree um it'll be interesting to see how that makes because ultimately look we've got to look forward right how excited about the Lions tour me and Goody were there three and a bit years ago whatever it was the last one to, to New Zealand and look you know I just retired new into the media, liked rugby, was a bit tired of it. When I got to New Zealand, we were there. How good was it, mate? I, I, it was unbelievable. It was, it was class, weren't it? So yeah. let's look forward and be positive. Leno, stay in your lane, mate. Gats is our man, our man, for the British and Irish Lions tour. And it's going to be an unbelievable tour down there. But Goody. the Chief Chief Chiefs, if you can say that, uh, they've struggled because they ain't want to go. Goody, let me put it this way, is... An 8-0 and o record in Super Rugby good enough for the Lions coach? Yeah, it's a completely different kettle of fish. Um, you know, let's not beat around the bush with this because I think the, the thing with Gats is he went back after the World Cup. He hasn't had a massive amount of time. And we did talk to him when, sorry, we did talk about him when uh, Super Rugby, the original Super Rugby started. And they won a few games. They were going okay, right? But, you know, they haven't a game in Super Rugby Aotearoa. You see what I've done over lockdown. I've learned to say that word because I've watched so much of it. It's improving. Um, yeah, but he, he, there is, like Jim said, there's no better man to lead the Lions. Look at his previous record. I think the big thing is, um, was it the right thing for him to take the Chiefs job straight after the World Cup, knowing the Lions tour was going on? I know he's next season he's now going on a sabbatical from the Chiefs. Um, so... That was perhaps the thing. And it was kind of just getting back into that New Zealand fold um, quickly, knowing full well that he could then go off and coach the Lions. So I think hindsight, everyone in New Zealand or perhaps people in Morikato could have said, well, actually, let's just bring him back straight after the Lions tour 
and then he's back fully and there's no other distractions because it's easy now once you've gone 0 and 8 people are saying oh he's not the right coach of the Lions well he is on this side of the world there's no better man as Jim said and as I agree with to lead us to South Africa but over in New Zealand of course he's going to get prickly people coming at him for the um, their results and, and that's part of being a coach so it has no effect to I don't think to us over here how he's gone in sub, Super Rugby Aotearoa I know come Lions time he's got the ingredients he's got the understanding of what it takes let's not forget they went to New Zealand they drew a series when everyone thought we were going to get 3 0 um, and you know he has got pedigree he's got understanding he'll take us out to South Africa and he'll win us that series 3 0 so happy days Thanks, Goody. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Producer Tim. And thank you very much for listening as well. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and everywhere else. And if you have time, leave us a review on iTunes. That would be very much appreciated as well. And now that you've finished listening to the podcast, go to beer52.com forward slash rugby and get yourself some free beers as well. Eight free beers. Why wouldn't you? Rugby pod. Rugby pod. Pod, pod, pod.